morning, a helicopter crashed in Brovary, Kyiv region. The helicopter crash near kindergarten there were killed. The leadership of the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine died. A helicopter of the State Emergency Service of Ukraine, which was en route to one of the active battle zones, crashed and caught fire nearby the kindergarten, with children and staff being there at the time. There were the Minister of Internal Affairs of Ukraine, Denis Monastirsky, his first deputy, Yevhen Yenin, State Secretary of the Ministry of Internal Affairs, Yuri Lukovich, their assistants and the helicopter crew on board. All of them lost their lives. I solemnly swear. It goes without saying that there was no coincidence in me taking up this position at that time. Perhaps my whole fate and my whole life have been preparing me for this very moment. He came up with the idea to start a video diary so that he wouldn't forget certain moments. The emotions that left in his living memory after he had experienced certain events, so that he could feel them again. The seventh day of the war. Every day, as I have already said, feels like the last one. The fourteenth day of the war. It's Easter today. I have lost count of the days of the war. He was probably writing down his thoughts, those he couldn't say out loud. We need a deep understanding of life, death and the purpose in life, the meaning of life, in order not to plunge into this despair that is terribly dragging us in every moment of the present day. We just had a narrow circle of people who were here and managed all the processes. He was one of this narrow circle of very responsible people. I have a lot of respect for him. He got this idea to start the video diary from a film that was actually our family's favorite film. We've seen it probably 20 times in different languages. It was Avatar. As for me, he even seems to have some sort of resemblance with the main character, but he started to film only at the beginning of the war. Explosions. Oh my God, they started attacking Kyiv. Good afternoon, everyone. I want to say that I stay in Kyiv. Definitely Kyiv will stand for itself, defend itself and fight till the end. For three nights before everything started, before the invasion, Denise hadn't spent a night at home. The phone ran and I picked it up. That was Denise and he told me, Jana, it has started. Denise was one of the political figures that the enemy had every intention to put out of their way first. I was torn into two halves. I understood that Denise was staying in Kyiv while I was going with the children somewhere in the direction of Western Ukraine. I was very worried about him. I wrote to him, please be safe. And Denise replied to me, saying, the most important things now is to save Ukraine. Denis was responsible for all the operational work. The border guards kept their eyes on everything. The police officers, those were the SES officers in most cases. 
If there is an understanding of the situation, there can be some recommendations for decision making. Denis kept abreast of the situation and, of course, then reported directly to the president. We just had a narrow circle of people who were there, who were on Bankova Street and who managed all the processes starting with weapons, food, fortification of districts, up to the defense of the capital. There were not that many people, those managers who controlled this process. All the others disappeared, someone went somewhere, ran away, left and such like. Later all of them came back and started telling us what we did right and wrong at the time when there were only a few of us. Probably when there were a few of us, I think that was the time when only friends stayed. Maybe so. He was one of the people of this narrow circle, of very responsible people who have no right to give up. Not only because they have such a position, not only because they love Ukraine, believe in the country and are patriots, but because they are obliged to stay. It is certainly appropriate to say that it is the individual who makes history. The first call was a video call. I reported that there had been missile strikes on Novi Petrivci, that there was an attempt to land an airborne assault group in Hostomel, that there was a battle going on. I said, Mr. Minister, today we have to coordinate certain issues with you. I will make decisions and report them back to you, because there is no time to wait, no time to coordinate anything with anyone else. He said, make decisions and report back. If you need mine, they will be made. Then there was a fight. Justified. In fact, we did not let the airborne assault group take place there. If your boss trusts you, you cannot let him down. Because this trust is worth a lot. He not only trusted me, he trusted people in general. All people. I had a chance to hug Minister Monastirsky, real manly, only once in my life. It was on the second or third day of the war when he came to the territory of the ministry. He came up and just hugged me, which was absolutely not in his vein. That is about the power of trust that arose between us then, the trust of the beginning of the war, the trust because we did not betray each other and we did not make a mistake. Russian troops are close to the capital. The military and law enforcement units are neutralizing them. Enemy subversive groups are in the city. Bridges in the capital are under protection and special control. There are checkpoints being set up as well. There were subversive groups that tried to enter and entered our cities. In the first hours there was a lot of panic. So we started by ensuring order in the cities of those citizens who stayed, who did not leave. Denis Anatolievich behaved not even as a minister, but as a civilian and creative person who thought about the means needed to defend ourselves. We needed weapons to defend ourselves. And I actually came to check it out. Here, opposite the circus, they are giving out weapons. Whoever has the desire, come and take it. That's it. Glory to Ukraine. The decision to issue weapons to civilians, to those who are ready to defend their country, was his decision. We are working, fully organizing defense, protection against subversive groups and the distribution of weapons. In Kyiv alone we have issued more than 25,000 automatic weapons and about 10 million rounds of ammunition, RPGs and other grenades. 
It was organized not only in Kyiv, it took place all over the country. Interestingly, but Denis loved guns. He was a very good shooter. In fact, he used to shoot at a shooting range, and he taught his children, at least his eldest son. But before he started any manipulations with the gun, Denis taught both children how to handle the weapon. They had a shooter's code. Both of them had these rules hanging above their beds. There even was a case that at one point we were at the shooting range. I think it was his eldest son. He said, so if you want to shoot, then tell me the tactical and technical characteristics of the gun. And the child told him everything he had learned. When the country is in danger, it is my manly duty to be its defender. We understand that all people are different, and you cannot be responsible for everyone for how well or poorly they will use this weapon. It was a big risk for the minister, as he, being a fairly cautious and tolerant person, made this decision. We as military men knew how to do it, how to make sure that all these weapons were accounted for. It was the only right decision, in my opinion, in those first days of the war. Well done, guys. We will catch all of you, guys. I want to praise the self-organization of our people, not only in Kyiv, but all over the country. I'm proud to see people defending their towns, their villages, their streets, their homes. They organize themselves to prevent looting and robbery, because the police are now busy, among other things, countering the subversive groups that operate in different towns and villages. Well, we find them and f*** them out of here. If it's one person, of course, they can't fight an army. But if it's thousands of people, or a million people, then of course they can fight an army. That's how it has worked for us. Glory to Ukraine! Glory to heroes! In addition, our advisors and departments there made up a very high-quality PSYOPs for Russia, saying Guys, you're not going to get away with it here. Everyone here is already armed. This will happen to all of you, pork chops. When they were coming in, this also played a role. They were scared of everything. They were sure that everyone was sitting behind the fence and shooting at them. Damn Russia, burn down! When we can see the equipment approaching different cities and together with the military we are forming a reliable rear. I would like to thank all our guardsmen and border guards who were the first to meet the battle. I would like to thank our police officers who are on duty in the cities, our rescuers who put out fires. All those who took up arms, free citizens of free Ukraine. Today's Ukraine is us. And we are Ukraine, and we will survive. I think each of us is looking for our own mission. And often, when we find it, we don't always understand that this is it. For example, there were a lot of questions about Denise being appointed Minister of Internal Affairs. Dear colleagues, dear Ukrainian people, Today is a very important and responsible day for me. It was in the summer, he came home and just said, I had been offered the job of Minister of Internal Affairs. I was very excited, to be honest. I think I even cried at the time. I understood that this position would always be associated with negativity. It was probably the only time in my life that I saw him a little nervous. The first and only time. It was a difficult decision for him, for sure. I understood the responsibility, some kind of burden that he would have to bear on his shoulders, 
and how he would cope with that. He was not a man from the system. He was a man who did not have such a huge and extensive managerial experience. He was a lecturer in the Khmelnytsky University of Management and Law. He taught the theory of state and law there. Then he worked in a law firm. And after that he moved to Kyiv. He was just a member of parliament. He was the head of the law enforcement committee, and he did not work in any central executive body. He had a completely civilian view of what was happening in the country. I am not a systematic person myself, and I wanted other values to be used by statesmen or managers of Ukraine. And those whom I want to trust, whose eyes are burning with enthusiasm. Denis was one of them. I saw this energy in his eyes. Secondly, he was an absolutely professional person. He was the head of the relevant committees in the Verkhovna Rada, and he had a deep understanding of the reforms that he introduced. He wrote the same laws, or was one of the people who co-authored them. It's very important to understand that you don't do something because you've been told to do it, because it's been handed down to you from above. No, that you can be both an ideologist and a part of this reform. That is, he was such a person, a professional, creative person in his own field. He said that if he was caught, it meant he was caught for a reason, and he was ready. Yeah. I, Denis Anatolievich Monastersky, am aware of the high responsibility of a member of the Cabinet of Ministers of Ukraine and solemnly swear allegiance to the Ukrainian people. It goes without saying that there was no coincidence in me taking up this position at that time. Perhaps my whole fate and my whole life have been preparing me for this very moment. I think that somewhere around that moment he realized what he had to do for Ukraine, to ensure maximum security for people. So, of course, I can't say that he saved Kyiv alone, but he was the part of the whole system in the country that really kept not only Kyiv, but Ukraine as a whole. The situation was unfolding extremely quickly. It was already clear that a number of cities were under the threat of occupation. We have it, we're standing here now, you can show it to your Belarusians. Kyiv suddenly found itself in the range of enemy military vehicles. It became clear that we needed to act immediately, to evacuate people, valuables, material and cultural property and so on. All of our colleagues began to dismantle exhibitions in museums, prepare collections for evacuation and pack them. And of course, anything related to this required protection. So we immediately addressed Denis Monastirsky in the first place, because it was about the security of evacuation measures. I understand that he had a huge amount of work on his plate. To be honest, sometimes I thought about how they could stand everything. Denis was always being interested in the history of many nations in general. He was interested in the culture of peoples, the history of peoples. When you learn about the culture and history of other peoples, it gives you the opportunity to get to know yourself more and to understand your own people and your own country. We did our best to travel around Ukraine. We tried to discover new places in Ukraine, and we saw the state of Ukrainian cultural monuments. We realized that it shouldn't be like this, that it should be in a completely different state. We thought about how we could influence this situation, what we could do in this regard. I first met Denis Anatolievich in 2009, when I became the director of the reserve. A young man came to me and offered me joint volunteer projects. This is how our cooperation began. He was a lecturer at our local University of Management and Law, and he had the opportunity to involve students. 
Also, he was one of the founders of the NGO Into the Future Through the Culture. And we were cleaning the fortress of stones, of self-planting trees, bushes and so on. And in fact, we worked very hard. Denise always told us the story of either the estate where we were working or the historical cultural highlight where we were. They traveled around the Khmelnytsky region and restored all the historical monuments that, well, in principle, needed to be restored, and especially Medjibish. He managed to organize and apply for the presidential grant, and it was with this grant for the protection of cultural heritage, which was up to a million hryvnias, that he managed to purchase construction materials. Denis Anatolievich completed a course in mountaineering, and he and his friends began to do the work. Yes, it is. You can see everything. The wall. Denis Monastirsky first decided, together with the Minister of Culture, to take these valuables to certain locations, where they are now mostly located. I will not say whether it's in our country or abroad, but we have been transporting and escorting these valuables around the clock. Now we are talking about hundreds of thousands of rescued museum objects. I said that the country would remember this after the war, that we had preserved our identity for our people, for our history, for our children. He was always been in search of a national idea. He was also a very interesting part of his personality. There is one gift he gave me during the war. It's a copy of Hetman Sahaidachny's sword. It says that during the Russian-Ukrainian war it was a gift from him. They make them in western Ukraine, I think somewhere there. He specially ordered it for me, because the president of a country that is fighting against Russian aggression, against these occupiers, should have such a sword as he believed. I told him, you know, it seems to me that maybe there is a day yet to come when we will get not only a copy for the state, I will keep the copy, but maybe we will have the original. He said, definitely, when we defeat the Russians, everyone will definitely bring us the originals. I am shocked. Brotherly bombing. The seventh day of the war. It's hard because the seventh day is always the third seventh days are often a turning point in any event. It is the same here. The news from the front is consistently difficult. The troops are arriving, being reinforced with new forces and are actively bypassing Kyiv. In Kyiv, we understand that there are more than a hundred subversive reconnaissance groups working to mark settlements, to establish who lives here, to conduct various sabotage and reconnaissance activities. We have organized counter-sabotage work in the Ministry of Internal Affairs, and we are eradicating these groups. They have been identified by phone. 
The subversive group was taken by the employees of the Darnitsa Police Department and members of the armed forces of Ukraine. This is the only way they can end up. I remember that we communicated because we really needed this connection. The feeling that there was at least some connection between us. I remember that in the first days Denis really seemed to know everything he was supposed to do. He reassured us that everything would be fine. But after about a week I felt that the situation itself was very difficult, even though he didn't say so. The main issue now is to hold on the cities, to hold on Kyiv. And this is one of the topics that concern me now. Denis always had this core inside him that allowed him to make decisions, to say yes or no. But during the war he, I don't know, crystallized this core even more. He became more confident. If a person doesn't have such a core inside, they will break one day or another. Because the tragic events, the victims that we are witnessing today, that are passing through our consciousness, undoubtedly plunge us into the bottomless pit of hatred, sadness and despair. We need a deep understanding of life, death and the purpose in life, the meaning of life, in order not to plunge into this despair that is terribly dragging us in every moment of the present day. Residential building has been just attacked. People were queuing to the pharmacy. It has just been attacked. Every day, as I have already said, feels like the last one. Today as well there was supposed to be a large-scale offensive, but it did not start. It may start tomorrow. They announced that tomorrow there will be large-scale shelling of Kyiv. Kharkiv is being completely destroyed. Hostomel, Bucha, Vorzel have become just like the Donetsk airport. A terrible battlefield where people are no longer surviving. Local people are living whenever possible. But not always they have such a chance. We suffer losses, but nevertheless hate should not infect our hearts. This is important, hugging everyone with love. He is definitely a peacemaker. That is, he himself is not about violence, of course, or other related phenomena. It was hard for him. It is March 9th, 2022, the 14th day of the war. Today joined the evacuation of people from the collection point from the Kyiv region Bucha, Vorzel, Ostomel, Borodyanka, Irpin. It was not possible to evacuate people from some places, in particular from Bucha, Borodyanka and Ostomel. People left Irpin and Vorzel. I saw their eyes. Of course, those are eyes of war, very tired, broken, some were disappointed. Grab my neck. Hush, hush. So he was a minister who loved people. He believed that it was his duty, that he had to be there when people were struggling. We're probably similar to the military, a little tougher. For us, the main thing was the process itself. There was a thousand people who had to be evacuated. So we had to put the elderly and babies into evacuation buses or cars first and take them out. We still perceived it differently as a civilian. Today I saw an infant born during the war, right there, just nine days old, a baby, a little baby. He was named Mark in front of me. Of course, it was extremely hard softening, interesting and valuable. Such an experience and such a feeling is very, very rare. He could still feel that it was important to people. 
He could feel it at the level of intuition and at the level of his own feelings and sensations. And he built his work accordingly when he set the relevant tasks. He paid special attention to this. Well, of course, we also began to pay attention to such things at that time. He always said that we are the Ministry of your protection, your security, when he addressed people. And that is why it was important for him to be at the forefront from the very first days. That's why it was important for him to understand whether people were receiving humanitarian aid in the areas that came under fire of medical aid is being carried out there. People are the center of everything. That was about Denis Monastirsky. Let's move on. The war continues. We will definitely win the war, I'm positive. After all, not the army that fights, when it's the people who fight, it's impossible to lose. When the hostilities started, we realized that this is not just a war, this is genocide of the Ukrainian people. In fact, this is what they have already done to us more than once. When Butcher and Irpin were liberated, when our police came in there, we had to see what was happening there. These are very scary pictures. There was some connection there, but not here. Stop. It was really impossible to be there. First of all, there were a lot of unexploded objects on the territory, scattered right on the streets. There were also a lot of body remains. There was a lot of broken equipment, so it was impossible to walk at all. He understood that the atrocities of the Russians, their war crimes and what they were doing on the territory of Ukraine had to be shown and told out loud to the world. It was his decision to organize press tours to Bucha and Erpin. Do you see? There, look closely. Back then, 480 journalists went on the first press tour. I think it will be difficult to bring up another such press tour. Ukraine is bringing foreign journalists like us to this town called Bucha. These photos went around the world. Everyone knows these photos from Bucha. The line of humanity was definitely crossed. That is, you cannot say that this was done by humans who have some kind of culture, people who have some kind of understanding of humanity. Their actions have absolutely nothing to do with that. What everyone saw about Bucha and Irpin is not even half of what I saw with my phone and our police, National Guard and armed forces of Ukraine. I remember coming into the office late at night with the materials that had been given to me to work on. He picked up his phone and started showing me the horrific footage. Look, how can this happen? Can this happen in the 21st century? You understand that you can't show it. 
This is sensitive content. This is the kind of content that no media can get to work with. Denis Anatolievich was very well aware of this, and he had very friendly, good relations with the ministers of internal affairs of European countries. He was constantly negotiating with them, he constantly had chats about the genocide type of war, about the destruction of the Ukrainian people, about the war to destroy Ukrainians. He talked to them about this without hidden emotions and without censorship. He tried not to tell me any details, although, of course, I understand that it was very difficult for him. It was during this period, I now understand that it was during this period that he sent me photos from St. Sophia of Kiev. In fact, this was probably his opportunity to heal this psyche, his soul, just to go there, to stay there, so that after what they saw there, they could somehow just recover from it. He said, I really like St. Sophia. When I'm having a hard time, I come to St. Sophia's Cathedral. It is there that I somehow can relax both mentally and physically. I understand that this was his place of power, in fact. I understand that this particular position of Minister of Internal Affairs was very difficult for him, as a burden for a person who emphasizes a lot. It is April 19th, 2022. If everything goes well, tomorrow I will see my family. I have always admired him for his special relationship. Not a warm one, but just a heat-warming one with his wife and his sons. When you hire someone or look at them as a candidate for a particular position, you ask, I ask at least, about their family. I'm interested. I've just never said it, by the way. I'm interested in what a person lives for, what is important to them, who is very important to them. If these values are basic, they are human, I think these are important signals. <laughs> it was our family joke. I always said, Denise, well, in fact, I did the best I could for our children, because I chose the best father for them. And then everything depends on you. The children incredibly love him. I can't say that they loved him. They love him. It's quite difficult for them now. Wait. Every breakup is f followed by a meeting. And every meeting is followed by a breakup. Wait. And this is a valuable, the most valuable treasure, the most valuable wealth that you can have. When I returned from Western Ukraine, we met at Denis' workplace. I arrived at his place in the evening. It was really an extremely joyful meeting for us. And at the first moment, Denis actually suggested that I go and see specifically the airport of Hostomel. But of course, on the way to this airport, we passed through Bucha and Irpin. On the way, Denis told me that a lot of things had been cleared up and there was a small amount of equipment left. By a large, it was already rusty. 
but I remember that we even, I personally saw some specific parts of the bodies of Russian soldiers. And I remember my feelings that I really didn't have any pity for them. I was surprised at the time, because for me, in principle, any human suffering is compassionate, no matter who that person is. Then I probably realized that we had changed. I had no pity for these people. I had only one question. Why did they come to this land? The fact is that for Denise any violence was absolutely unacceptable, not only against humans, but against any living being in general. Denise was also asked what he would do if he had to take a gun and go and actually have to kill people. And he told me that for him the only justifiable possibility of killing another person is to defend his homeland. Ukraine apparently was above even some of his convictions. A very serious part is the National Guard, which has become a powerful unit of our security and defense forces with such a great number of guys. He motivated them. He had been to all of the hotspots. It's Easter today, April 24th, 2022. The 60th day of the war. This day is again the 24th, again a special day. And I decided to spend it in the East with the police officers who are now serving here, with the National Guards, with the Border Guards and with the rescuers. We left Dnipro very early and went through all the most difficult places. Some people were particularly doubtful whether I would be able to get there, because in Lysychansk, for example, there was shelling. There was artillery shelling from Grads nearby. <laughs> Incoming! Get down! Get to the car! Move! He was a brave man enough. If he needed to drive or fly somewhere, it was not a problem for him. He was always ready to do it. He obviously understood the seriousness of the situation, so that everything could happen. And so he said, I have a lot to do and I don't have a lot of time. Such trips certainly change the people's attitude to the minister and the ministers to the people who serve on the front line. We're definitely connected now, definitely united. And on such a special great day as Easter, it was especially solemn to be present here and award the guys personally. When a high-ranking official, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, visits a soldier, an officer, a surgeon on the front line, and just without even handing anything, says, thank you. They don't need anything else. Because they see that there is a person next to them and he thanks them for the work they do. The words thank you are the most motivating for a person, a soldier, a defender. It seems to me that at times he was directly drawn to them. And I think that if Denis had not been a minister, he would have definitely gone to war. He had been to Donetsk region, Zaporizhia, Odessa many times to see the real situation with his own eyes, to understand how is it going, what is happening there and what is needed and what may not be needed.
we still have very few shells. Each shell is very precisely used as a valuable asset, very precisely. I hope that in a week or two the situation should change and we will receive the guns that America, Canada, Britain and France are sending us. These are important things that can change the course of this war. We will win. This is our main goal and our main task so far. Everything will be fine. Some of those trips were to the front line, and others were after we were massively shelled in the rear areas. You remember those in Kremenchuk and Vinnytsia. The first reports then were from the police, because the police arrived at the place where these missiles hit first. He would get into a helicopter and fly to a city like Vinnytsia or Kremenchuk. You see, it was important to see and feel how well all of our units work together, the city authorities, the regional authorities, how well they cooperate with each other. These are hospitals and there is, for example, some kind of support, assistance to the population. It's about resettling people somewhere, if there are any cases. He communicated with the victims and donated blood, even this happened. All this fuss over shelters, so to speak, was initiated by Denis. He brought up this question very firmly indeed. Before the attack at the arms store, you remember, this took place in Kremenchuk. There was an alarm. The air raid siren was announced at a certain time. What time was it hit itself? Okay, let's go. We're getting out of here. Let's go. Where is the shelter? Over there. In the area we look at everything else, that people had opportunities to save their lives. If they had reacted to this air raid alert and gone to the shelter, because they had more than enough time to go to the shelter and save their lives. That's the logic of it. He also spoke about this. At the same time it was decided that everything would be closed during the alert. This rule was implemented after his decision. Today it's September 30th, 2022. A lot has happened recently. Today I was in Zaporizhia, where in the morning there was a terrible assault at the place where dozens, hundreds of cars were gathering and leaving for the temporarily occupied territory. People were going there to visit their families and property. Most of them were families, elderly people, driving old snags, cars that are no longer really worth collecting. And then three S-300 missiles hit exactly there with precision, taking 30 lives and 88 people are wounded so far. Much, much has been lost. <laughs> And Russia tries to accuse us of doing this, to blame Ukraine for these strikes. Very soon a helicopter with journalists arrived there. They were mostly foreign journalists. We wanted to show the world what was happening here and now in Ukraine, so that this endless lie that was pouring out of the Kremlin's mouthpieces could be seen as pale as it actually is. The world's main terrorist, Putin, is entirely responsible for the terrible tragedy that took place today. 
There is no doubt about that, and you can see where the missiles came from. The missiles were modified as 300s. They were modernized to explode immediately after contact with the surface and to cause more damage to the people, ordinary people who were here. It's one thing when the mayor of a city says this, with all respect, but it feels absolutely in another way when the minister, in this case, of the interior affairs says so. In fact, it was a message that they will fight and kill civilian people, not distinguishing between military and civilians. Basically, it's nothing new. They have been doing it and will continue to do it. Only our Western partners, of course, should help us more, so we can overcome this evil as soon as possible. I am tired to visit this place, a place of mass death, mass grave of Russian uh, troops. I see Zoom, we see Vinitsa, Kremenchuk and etc. I propose to honor the memory of our heroes with a minute of silence. Of course, he was very worried. I'm sorry, but in fact, we're losing population. He took care of every soldier. Those who had already died, those who, thank God, were alive, deserved a high award, a distinction, and so on. He passed everyone through himself. He looked at these cards. He looked at the history. There, he just looked at it. Denis Anatolievich believed that the memory of everyone should be preserved. Taking into consideration our losses and how often our soldiers die defending our country, he asked us to record as many of these stories as possible. We cooperated with the Institute of National Memory, providing them with archives our photos and video footage. I tell myself this, as well as a remark and a note that is very important for our lives. Respect is something that should be felt everywhere in Ukraine in relation to our defenders, our military, our rescuers, our police, our guards and border guards. All those who are defending our independence back to back today. And he said to me, despite the war, we have to communicate and meet with people even more. For him, every meeting was extremely important. I remember when we had a Christmas meeting with the minister. On that day, before the new year, there was no electricity in Kyiv. And the meeting was about to be cancelled. We told Denis Anatolievich that the meeting would be cancelled because it was dark, and he said to light up candles. The best cadets who showed heroism during the war came from all over Ukraine. The cadets who were in captivity, the cadets who rescued people, the cadets who guarded cities in the first days of the war. And Denis Anatolievich said that he wanted his two sons to be present at the meeting. I answered that they probably may not be very interested. He rejected and said that he wanted his sons to learn lessons from the examples of our youth. It was a candlelit meeting. And I remember how long that meeting lasted and how bright our cadets came out, inspired by every word and moment of communication with Denis Anatolievich. It is a great pleasure for me. I personally received a lot of interesting thoughts and emotions, which are also important to me. I thank each and every one of you. Most importantly, Ukrainians today have a unique opportunity to get rid of the inferiority complex that has been instilled over the centuries. 
This unique opportunity must be taken advantage by all of us, because we are today the representatives of the best, bravest, most courageous nation in the world, and we must pass this on to our children. From the very first days of his work, Denise was a huge light. And around the light, everything comes to life, acquires a new meaning, sprouts, and becomes brighter. Of course, the war changed Denise. He became, you know, more tougher, more demanding. He appreciated every minute. We became close people, very close. I just have a lot of respect for him. He was really everything to me. He was a friend, he was a mentor, he was a beloved husband, and he was the father of my children. He was supposed to be in Izum to award the National Guard. When he was supposed to visit the Donetsk region, then he was supposed to visit the Dnipro region. You remember that an enemy missile hit a residential building there at the time. He wanted to visit this place, so he flew by helicopter because it was a bit faster. I have this lawn table. Unfortunately, I don't like lawn tables, but I can't change the furniture here. I live with what I have. And there is a chair where Denis always sat. And whoever sits down, I look at this person, and I always have a feeling that something is wrong, that he is somewhere nearby. We have to understand that we shouldn't forget what we are fighting for. Not only for liberation of the territory, it's to defend the values that our people have, the values of family, the values of, well, our inner origin. This very sophistication, the wisdom that our ancestors had and that we have, helps us to fight today and build a new, independent Ukraine tomorrow. We will definitely win. Glory to Ukraine!